College football season of upsets spilled over into college basketball continued this weekend. We'll see how far down the road it continues this year. Hey, how are you folks? Jason Horowitz. Glad to be with you on Parrish's Three Pointers, where we hear and listen to every single thing that our college basketball columnist Gary Parrish has to say. And for that, let's bring him in. Gary Parrish, Spike, how you doing, buddy? Everything's gold. How are you? Everything's fantastic on this end. You know, it was a weekend of upsets. We'll get into UCLA's loss to USC in a sec. Uh, well, you know, North Carolina losing at home to, to Maryland. It left Memphis and Kansas at the top. Memphis more than double the first place votes in this week's AP. But are they that much better than Kansas in your mind? Oh, no, certainly not that much better or even better. I mean, that's the, been the question all week long. Who's better, Memphis or Kansas? It's kind of like asking, you know, if, if blues your the best color, or red, or if chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla ice cream. There's just no right answer to it. But I can say this. Memphis does have the resume of a number one team. They're 17-0 and overall, 5-0 and against the top 50, 6-0 and against the top 100 against a schedule ranked 49th in the country. Compared to Kansas, Kansas 17-0, and 4-0 against the top 50, 9-0 and against the top 100, against a schedule rated 50. So it's basically you know, a tick for attack. They both have wins over Arizona, Oklahoma, USC. Memphis also has wins over Georgetown and UConn. Uh, Kansas has wins over Boston College and Ohio. So they, and they both have pros on their roster. They both have depth, deep benches. So it's a toss-up, really. And Bill Self was asked about this uh, earlier this week, and he said Memphis is number one because it started ahead of Kansas in the preseason polls. And he's exactly right. That's the only reason Memphis is one and Kansas is two. But in whichever order, it is two really, really good teams. Uh, do you, just to follow that up, do you think either or both will go undefeated? I think Memphis has a, a real, real chance. I mean, all the, all the tough games are at home, and all the tough games are really behind them. You get Tennessee coming in uh, February 23rd, Gonzaga coming in this weekend. But those are home games. And if you're really a – forget number one team. If you're really a top five team, you're not supposed to lose at home. And so you knock those out. The Conference USA schedule is as bad as everybody says it is. And uh, can they do it? Certainly. Will they do it? That's another question. They continue that schedule uh, tonight, Wednesday night at Tulsa. Meanwhile, Kansas welcomes Iowa State to uh, Fog Allen Fieldhouse. Meanwhile, let's stay in the Big 12. Last week uh, we talked about it, and you wrote about it in your weekend recap. Texas A&M, you said it on this segment that they were about to hit a wall, and they did it at Texas Tech, and then they lost to Kansas State by 21 points. But there's another Big 12 team that you think is about to fall off here. Who is it? It could be Baylor. I mean, they're 15-2 and two overall. They're into the top 25. It's a nice record. It's a great story. But what's really there? They've got a four-point win over Notre Dame, a win over Winthrop. That's nice. But 13 of their 15 wins have come against opponents ranked outside the top 100. Uh, looking closer, Baylor's 0-2 against the top 50, 2-2 two two against the top 100. So there's a reason to be skeptical heading into what is a ridiculously tough stretch here. Starts Wednesday night at A&M. Then you get Oklahoma at Texas, Texas Tech at Kansas, at Oklahoma State, Texas, at Oklahoma, Kansas State. That means eight of their next nine are against top 100 opponents. Seven of the nine are against top 50. So, again, there's a reason to think this might come crashing down. But the good news is we're going to know one way or another really quickly. If the Bears are legit, we'll know soon. If they're not, we're going to know that too. If they can go 6-3 and three through that stretch, you found out that that's a very good basketball team. Uh, oh, down, down they there would take 6-3 and three right now. Yeah, 6-3. and three. Even 5-4 and four at that stretch, you're going to find a very good basketball team, and Scott Drew certainly has turned it around. Meanwhile, uh, you were out in uh, Los Angeles this weekend covering the UCLA's loss on CBS uh, to USC. It may be ridiculous to say this, but maybe not. O.J. Mayo, he did not have that many shots in the game. You think they play better when he doesn't shoot the ball more. Absolutely. I mean, he, O.J., for all the criticism he takes, he's, he's a very smart player, a guy who understands how to play basketball. He sees things that a lot of uh, you know, guards, point guards particularly, just do not see. He's, he's really, really good in, in terms of vision. And, and so sometimes guys don't make a pass because they don't see it. That's never been the case with O.J. If he's not passing the ball, it's because he doesn't want to. And then you just look at you know, the way they played uh, Saturday. They go into UCLA and win with him taking 12 shots. I don't think that's a coincidence. Eight times this year he's taking 16 or fewer shots. USC is 8-0 in those games. They're 3-6 and six when he takes more than 16 or more shots. Uh, the most famous example being that loss to Mercer. So, yeah, it appears USC might be better when O.J. shoots less. And it's because when he's not shooting, he's creating. When he's creating, he's creating for others. And it makes USC tougher to defend. Plus, I think it helps with team morale when everybody else on the court doesn't feel like they're just standing around waiting on O.J. to do something. So, um, if they can get this into his head, and he seems to be coachable on some level, um, I, I think USC is going to be tough to deal with because he doesn't have to do everything with Davon Jefferson, Taj Gibson, Daniel Hackett right beside him. He's got teammates, and when he uses them, that team's better. 
Yeah, there's certainly a lot of talent around them uh, there for Tim Floyd. All right, let's let you rant a little bit here. Uh, people know about the Big East and the fact that nobody is, is uh, undefeated at this point in conference play. You go from 3 to 12, and basically everybody's separated by a game uh, it's go throughout the country. What's your, th- what's your take on conference standings at this point in the season? Well, this is the time of the year where people start to look at conference standings and decide who's good and who's not. My advice, don't do it. It's misleading. Most leagues have unbalanced schedules, just like the Big East. You get some weird standings in January. Like DePaul, 4-2 and two and tied for second. UConn, 3-3 three and three and tied for 10th. So is DePaul better than UConn? No. DePaul's played an easier league schedule than UConn. One that has allowed the Blue Demons to play four of their first six at home. They've already got Rutgers and St. John's, two of the worst teams in the league. Meanwhile, UConn has to play at Georgetown, at Notre Dame, two of the toughest places in the league. So if you just have to look at conference standings, feel free, I guess. But it'd be wise to dig a little deeper before drawing any conclusions. Well, the Pauls did though beat Villanova and Pro- and Providence. Cincinnati has beaten Villanova and Syracuse at home. So, uh, I, just looking at the Big East, yes, the, the, those are misleading. But they do have some good wins at home. But it's certainly a very difficult schedule. Gary Parrish, thank you very much, sir. We will talk to you throughout uh, the rest of the. Well, we'll see you next week, and we'll talk to you uh, throughout the rest of the season. Looking good, man. All right, folks, there you have it. Parrish's three-pointers. But don't forget, In the Paint with Bill Raftery hits your internet and CBSSports.com beginning Thursday this week. And, of course, In the Paint every Monday and every Thursday, every week throughout the uh, rest of the season. For Gary Parrish, I'm Jason Horowitz. Take care.